What's up? I'm Gabby Wilson for MTV News, and I'm here with activist Tarana Burke, who is the creator of the Me Too movement that you've probably seen all over the internet um, after the mounting allegations against Harvey Weinstein for sexual harassment and assault and rape. A lot of people might not realize that Me Too starts with you and over 10 years ago. Talk to me about its genesis. Where did it come from? Um, I was working and living in the South uh, more than a decade ago, and working with young women in an um, organization that I started with a friend. And in that work, we kept having young people share their experience with sexual violence with us. And um, being a survivor of sexual violence, I wanted to try to find resources for them. Um, I had had experience with not being able to help a young person with um, their experiences earlier than that, and I didn't want to ever ha have that happen again. Um, but when I went to try to find resources, I couldn't find them. So it made me think about like what I needed at that time, like when I was that age, what, what I needed, when I started my healing journey, what, what did I need? Mm -hmm. And really, it was the empathy of other survivors that helped me start my healing journey. And so I thought a lot about how we can like convey empathy to each other as survivors and to young people um, in a way that was like succinct but both but powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and Me Too does that job. Yeah, definitely. How was that initially received? Like, in what what context did you like start Me Too? Oh, it was received well. So we had a or we had the organization and we did like programming for girls. Mm -hmm. um, we started Me Too as a campaign of the organization, and so we had um, we were on MySpace, <laughs> and we put it. You know, we once once we put it on MySpace, though, it kind of morphed from a thing for young people to just women in general because we started having like adults reach out to us and say thank you for this and you know and, and we appreciate it and me too and, and it got you know it was nothing like now but it made an impact in that moment and we realized we had to like create materials and start talking about this in a wider way mm -hmm. so then you know we would travel and do workshops and like trainings for people and that just kept going so it was a digital sort of idea sort of us. i mean yeah. well it was it was a campaign a live you know campaign first but you know, there was no way to do like websites back then, or at least right. I didn't know how to do websites. And so, social media was a totally different Right, it was totally then. different. MySpace was like a big deal, right? right? And so, we got the MySpace page and started just connecting with people. In fact, these t shirts, this is one of the original t shirts. Um, somebody who I met, this woman um, who had a company called Faharai, uh, Dominique, um, just contacted me and said, I love what you're doing, I want to donate. And so, like, her logo is on the shirt because she um, she met us on MySpace and donated these shirts to us. So, yeah, it just it just we realized the the magnitude of it at that time of like this could be a really big thing. It's so it's so helpful because sometimes you don't want to have a whole conversation right. and like saying me too can be a conversation starter or it can be the whole conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to say much more than that if you share your story of trauma with me and I empathize with that by saying me too, then we have an instant connection. Like right. there's a bond there that I understand your pain, I get it, I feel you. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that's enough. Yeah, and you don't have to like go into the whole story if you don't feel comfortable exactly. doing that. So I think a, a lot of people came across me too because of Alyssa Milano tweeting it out. Absolutely. How has it felt to see me too reach a wider audience in this way? It's kind of surreal. Yeah. Um, like I said, I think we knew early on the impact because every time I went into a new space and would talk to people and make a speech or do a training and we talked about Me Too, it was such a relief for people that they didn't have to be like, one time when I was, you know, they could like slip us a note that said Me Too or send an email. Um, so when I saw it growing virally, I, I did initially have some like, oh wow, how did this <laughs> happen? Like what's going to happen now? But it's been beautiful to watch it just blossom and, and so many people are impacted. Um, and then there, I think about all the people who ha are not able to say me too, mm -hmm. right? Who are just watching and from the back but still feeling cathartic by, by watching and knowing they're not alone. Right. So it's it's been amazing. In a way, uh, having community through just watching other people exactly. connect. Yeah. Exactly. Why do you think Me Too is such an effective form of therapy for survivors? One of the main things that I felt as a young person, as a young survivor, was that I was alone. Mm -hmm. Right? I felt like this was a thing that happened to me. It was my it was my secret shame. 
Um, there was no way for me to talk to somebody else about it. I felt complicit in my abuse, right, because I was a child and I thought, I broke all of these rules. Mm -hmm. I did, you know, as children you hear uh, your parents say things like, um, you know, don't let anybody touch your private parts or don't go with, walk away with strangers. And so... The, the onus and the blame is on the victim. Right. And so when that happens, you're like, oh my God, I broke these rules. And so Me Too allows you to either quietly or boldly understand that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what the power is. This, this, like you said, people are building community across the world just in the knowledge that they're not alone in their trauma. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it, it serves as therapy, but Me Too and the number of women that come out and have been putting Me Too as their statuses also speaks to, it speaks as evidence to mm -hmm. kind of the staggering number of women mm -hmm. who are victims of these things but may not necessarily report it. Was that ever an intent when you were creating Me Too, or is it just like something that has come secondary to it? So this, the hashtag is, has been about um, showing the numbers, right? Mm -hmm. I think when Alyssa Milano tweeted it out and, and it was initially the, the woman who wrote the first, like, if this happened to you, change your status to Me Too, was about showing the sheer number and the mm -hmm. sheer magnitude of people who are affected. And they've been successful in that, right? It's, it's like millions and millions of engagement with Me Too across social media. Um, but initially, it was really about a conversation between survivors. Mm -hmm. It was about me as a survivor saying to you that I see you and I hear you and I understand you. And so I think that both the outward facing and the inward facing message is so powerful, right? There's now this evidence and data that is undeniable, that mm -hmm. this is prevalent, it is pervasive, it is epidemic across the world, sexual violence, the spectrum of sexual violence. And at the same time, there is this community of people who understand each other and who know that they have support in some way, even if a very small way. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest reasons that young women don't speak out, particularly like if we're talking about like the Harvey Weinstein allegations, in a professional setting, they fear professional re retaliation. Or for younger like school age women, they fear that like societal retaliation. Mm -hmm. How does Me Too sort of circumvent that? and empower women to speak up? I hope that women who feel like, the, first of all, sexual violence is about power, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's, it's about power dynamics. And so if, whether it's Harvey Weinstein or your coach, there's still a power dynamic there that people should acknowledge. It's not about sex. Um, and I hope that in some cases people are emboldened by knowing that they're not alone and that, that when they come forward that people won't there, there are a community of people who will understand and who will show support, or if, or if not, there's a community that they can point to and say, I'm not crazy, like this thing happened, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's a way that when you experience sexual violence, it makes you um, doubt yourself, mm -hmm. right? There's shame, there's fear, and there's doubt. And so at the very least, there is this empirical evidence that exists that says, I'm not crazy. This is a thing that not just happens to me, but it happens across the world. So. That's a hope for me that people are, are emboldened in that way. Yeah, I'm glad that you bring up the, the power dynamic mm -hmm. of it because I think that's something that the Harvey Weinstein uh, allegation in news illuminates in particular, that there is a relationship between power and sexual violence. Mm -hmm. What advice would you have to young women who are entering professional situations for the first time via like in internships or first jobs after school? Yeah, I think that we have to, to teach young women, young people, um, to be vigilant, right? Um, but also, and to like really understand, I, I talk to my daughter from a very young age, very clearly, without mincing words, about what the world is like. And, and, and not trying to scare her, right? Not trying to um, um, create fear about being in the world, but just re the reality of these things. And also presenting myself as a resource. And so I would say to, to young people who are starting jobs or coming into these things, to be vigilant and to not doubt yourself. Like, trust your gut. If you're uncomfortable, if something happens that makes you feel like this is just not right, talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. Like, even if it's just to talk through it. Like, let me, I just want to share this situation with you. I want to make sure and check in and see. Like, have a mentor or a friend or somebody who you can sort of just touch base with, um, but just don't doubt yourself. Don't second guess yourself. Mm -hmm. The expansion of Me Too and everything that it represents has been kind of this watershed moment in mm -hmm. talking about sexual assault. 
and it's been so powerful for survivor to survivor conversation. What ripple effect do you hope that Me Too has in the conversation beyond survivors? I think that the conversation now needs to pivot. I think we have a lot of evidence. We have, you know, sort of the numbers that show um, just how pervasive it is. And I think that we now need to talk about the systems that are in place that allow sexual violence to flourish, right? I think we need to, the, Hollywood is a system. Like, um, patriarchy is really the, the system that allows sexual violence to flourish. So we need to start talking and looking at how do we dismantle these systems that are in place? How do we interrupt them so that sexual violence is not allowed to flourish? Um, we see the numbers and we hear the effects of it. And now, like, what do we do, both as survivors, because I think survivors have to, to lead that charge, mm -hmm. um, and as people who are allies of survivors and or bystanders or whatever, need to be involved in that conversation. Um, and I also think that we have to have a conversation about what survivors need, right? Like this is a moment that is, it is beautiful, but it's also very painful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I've also received like a lot of uh, feedback and messages from people who are like, I've been severely triggered by this, mm -hmm. by this moment. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to look at what healing looks like in our community. Right? Like we have a charge and an and a obligation and responsibility to interrupt sexual violence wherever we can. But at the same time, every day, even as we're fighting the good fight to do that, there are new survivors every day, every moment. Mm -hmm. right? The statistics tell us that. And so we need to also think about like, what does radical community healing look like for us? Like, we, we should know, this should just be an expectation for teachers and community people and that when you interact, if I'm in a room of 10 people, like for children, the statistic is one in four girls and one in six boys. So we know that we are constantly surrounded by survivors. So like, what do we need to do to shift our, the way we interact in, in the world and in our communities to start thinking about what healing looks like for our children and for ourselves? Are there any answers for that at this point? So uh, people ask me about this all the time, and I'm always really clear. I can't define what healing is for people yeah. because it's so different. Mm -hmm. I think that as communities though, we need to start talking, we need to have community conversations about what we can do community-wide mm -hmm. to, to, to do healing. And that looks like, you know, having trauma-informed schools, right? Like having schools that are ready and able and set up to deal with the trauma that our children are, are coming to school with. Mm -hmm. So that when you have young people, particularly in marginalized communities, you have young people who are quote unquote acting out, um, there should be a level before suspension and for expulsion that says we need to dig into this child's life and figure out what's happening. We need to have wraparound services so that we don't automatically just designate this girl who's loud and fighting as troubled, but try to understand what's happening, right? Like be able to respond to trauma. So I think that's a part of what community healing looks like. And there are so many different other ways and um, things we can do, but we have to start having a conversation about right. it. And I think that it's important to uh, point out too that you know this came out of the Harvey Weinstein conversation, but that is just one symptom of a larger system systemic problem. Absolutely, H Harvey Weinstein is just a person. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's a mistake for us to elevate these people to like these, these, these high statuses. He has a lot of money and money begets a lot of power and he has ruined a lot of lives and impacted a lot of lives. But for every Harvey Weinstein, there's a hundred thousand more folks that are right around us every day. Mm -hmm. Like we need to look at our neighbors and our uncles and our coaches and our priests and our pastors, right? Mm -hmm. Like these people are everywhere. Predators are everywhere. And I don't want us to start thinking like, oh, these separate people, like look what Harvey Weinstein did. Look what R. Kelly did. Look mm -hmm. what Bill Cosby did. You know, this is what's happening. They are representative of a larger problem. So what are the, the roadblocks that need to be removed to get to that next step so that we start having conversations about healing and conversations about how to like eradicate that? I think this 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 moment is a is a is a way that we can start you know having those conversations right i think some of the roadblocks are people are ashamed to have these conversations mm -hmm. shame i don't you know we don't talk enough about it we use it in passing like oh this person is shame is debilitating mm -hmm. um and empathy stomps out shame mm -hmm. right empathy is is sort of a um a way to help eliminate shame and so uh, the me too movement and the way that 
we talk about it. We talk about empowerment through empathy. And so I think it's a key for us to start taking away the shame, taking away the stigma of talking about this. And for those who are able to, not for everybody, but those who are able to tell their stories and talk about it and stand up and be vocal, we need to take look to their leadership to start figuring out how to have some difficult conversations in our communities. But it, it also takes courage. Every single Me Too that you see written down is backed with courage. Mm -hmm. And so we need more of that courage. We need more of people who are not survivors to stand up and say, I support this in a courageous way. Um, and I mean, the shift, movements take time to build, change takes time to build, but like we have to start. And I think this is a start. I think that's where we are right now. Definitely, nothing's gonna change if we can't talk about it. Exactly. You work with a lot of young people. How can young people help to make significant change in combating the like culture that leads to sexual violence? I mean, I think young people are the answer mm -hmm. to combating it, right? Like, I was asked a question recently about, because I think that we should be having talks, conversations about consent in mm -hmm. school, early, kindergarten, right? And the person was like, oh, how are you gonna talk to children about those, these heavy topics? And I'm like, children are not dumb. Like children are, are, are beautiful creatures that absorb all kind of information. I, I started talking to my child early about lots of topics that parents maybe not, maybe wouldn't um, choose to do, but think about a room full of five-year-olds. We, when we engage with children, we start off with rules, right? We say no running, no talking, no doing, no pushing, no shoving. What if we started having simple conversations like, no touching, and when somebody says they're uncomfortable, you have to stop right then. Mm -hmm. If somebody says, don't put your hands on me, you have to stop right then. Like, if we just add boundaries to those conversations, right? Mm -hmm. When I was a child, it was just say no, um, or uh, just say no to drugs, like mm -hmm. uh, Nancy Reagan and, you know, the McGruff the crime dog, mm -hmm. and you know, it was all of these like big things that came out in PSAs, yeah. but that was drilled into our head. Yeah. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs, right? right. There's all these like slogany things. Yeah. Um, and I think Me Too is used in a similar, can be used in a similar kind of way. We have to figure out ways to talk to young people because it's a young person. My daughter is um, queer and she's taught me, or they've taught me so much about the queer community and queer life. And I'm an old fossil, <laughs> but but they, I watch young people and they, they are so accepting. It, it's older people who have the trouble being um, accepting change. Young people get it. Mm -hmm. So if we start having those conversations with young people early and we start talking about those things early, they will shift the change the narrative and they will be key to changing the culture. Mm -hmm.